Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is his holy day that he has given us. And although we cannot gather together, although this uh, virus situation and circumstance has uh, locked us in our homes, this still remains the day of the Lord. The day in which we are reminded that the Lord has, our Lord Jesus Christ has uh, been resurrected from the dead. Uh, we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ together, regardless if we are uh, gathering together publicly as a church or if we are isolated in our homes alone with our families. We all gather together today in this single sentiment, in this single moment and desire to offer our great God the worship that is due to Him alone. Now, let me encourage you, therefore, this morning to... Uh, 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 gather together with your uh, with your family uh, to uh, get rid of your pajamas, get rid of your uh, cup of coffee. Um, this is the day of the Lord, and this is a moment when we are approaching the Word of God. Please, may this be a sober, uh, a moment of uh, a sober moment, a moment of uh, reflection, a mo a moment in which the seriousness of God's Word uh, really captures our attention, in which we come to be fed. Uh, with uh, respect, with honor, uh, and true address. Okay, this is not public worship. Uh, it is true. However, uh, this is a moment in which we gather together to approach the Word of God. Let us do that with respect and as well with our hearts and souls thirsty, uh, thirsting and hungering for the feeding that comes from us. Let us pray together as we approach Psalm 16 uh, together this morning. Let us pray. Great God in heaven, we pray that it will bless us as we gather together as your people, even uh, if it is virtually, that you will give us, O Lord, the sense of the seriousness of this time. May you also, O Lord, uh, encourage us through the reading and preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. Please uh, turn with me to uh, Psalm 16. Psalm 16 uh, a very appropriate for this season uh, in which uncertainty, the unknown, uh, what is ahead of us, and the present threats uh, uh, comes and assail our souls. Uh, what, a, what, what a wonderful moment for us to revisit Psalm 16 and have them even more firmly in our minds and our hearts. Psalm 16, a mictan of David. Give heed now to the reading of God's holy an inerrant word. O oh my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another god. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are my portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol nor will you allow uh, your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. Your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let us pray together again. Great God in heaven, we have read your word. And as you gather together uh, with your people in your holy day, regardless of where you they are. Father, we continue to pray and to desire that your covenantal promises will be once again fulfilled in our lives. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we approach this text together. 
that it would, O oh Lord, encourage our hearts, that it would uh, strengthen our faith, and that it would uh, make us see that our satisfaction is only in you, and that in you we are blessed with security, safety, and assurance. Most of all, Lord, we pray, point us to our Savior. Point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, who abides in heaven at your right hand, and who rules supreme over all the circumstances that come upon us. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. This virus has been indeed a very threatening situation, hasn't it? Perhaps that's exactly how you're feeling. Despite of the protection of your family, the protection of your home, the amount of death, the command for isolation has filled your heart with fear. You're feeling threatened. Perhaps even feeling to die, uh, feeling afraid of dying. Perhaps you feel right now that your life in are really in serious danger. And in this circumstance, where should we turn to? Where should we go? Who should we trust? Where should we place our confidence? Should we place our confidence and security in the state government, for example? And in all the measures uh, that Governor Whitmer is taking to uh, prevent this disease, to control uh, the amount of those who are being contaminated, to provide for uh, uh, the the hospitals, what they need to treat those who have already contracted the disease? Should they trust the federal government? Should they trust President Trump and the White House with its wise decisions uh, to uh, what to do in a circumstance like that? Should we trust in the physical uh, uh, practitioners or in their researchers? Physicians are right now battling to find a solution for uh, this problem. And researchers are, are laboring day and night in their laboratories trying to find a vaccine or a medication that will help us. Should they trust in our pantries, in our food supplies? Should they trust Costco to provide us the goodies that we need to go through this quarantine? The reality is that despite we having all these elements, we still feel unsafe, don't we? We are still afraid of contracting this disease. We're still afraid for our beloved ones. We are still very much afraid for our elderly ones. What's the solution? If all these alternatives ultimately do not bring us indeed confidence and satisfaction, if all these alternatives uh, may ultimately fail, where should we go for security and peace? David had found that solution. And by God's grace and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that has been written here in Psalm 16 for the blessedness of our souls. For in a circumstance that was threatening his life to the point of death, as we're going to see in verse 10, David was absent. David was not at all afraid. His soul and his heart was absolutely assured that his God, Yahweh, would be with him until the end. Even if death would come towards his direction, he would not be afraid because Yahweh is the one in which he finds satisfaction. And Christian, this is the same message that you need to embrace this morning. As we gather around the word of God, as we revisit Psalm 16, let us be reminded that while all earthly solutions and alternatives may fail, when it comes to this serious situation that has come upon the world, our triune God, Yahweh, is our refuge, both in life and also in death. You see, as we consider together Psalm 16 this morning, let us have this firmly set in our minds. Let us, let us have this firmly set in our hearts. Let, let us embrace this by the faith that has been supernaturally given to us by the Holy Spirit, that Yahweh, our triune God, is our refuge in both life and death. 
see, first of all, in verses 1 through 6, we, we understand, we learn clearly that the Lord is our refuge while we live. Christian, the Lord is your refuge while you live. You notice, uh, first of all, in verse 1, this, this deep agony that is expressed by David. The psalm uh, is clearly the composition of the king of Israel. And he says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. Uh, the psalmist prayers prays for preservation. His soul, soul is troubled. As we're going to see uh, again through the psalm, there is a threat, an imminent threat against his life. Enemies are arising, arising against him and attempting against uh, his existence. And it's precisely in this moment that he flees to hell. That's exactly the first way in which uh, David addresses God here in this home. He begins by addressing him as the might, omnipotent God can do anything he desires to do. This is the one in which he puts his trust. Now think about this. Here is the king of Israel. Here is the one uh, that has uh, the royal palace under his control. He is the one that has an entire army at his service. Great men of war ready to give their lives for the king. Here is as well the best fighter in Israel. Undoubtedly, uh, a man like David, who killed a bear and a lion with his own hands, who defeated uh, the, the Philistine giant, who conquered many, many of the enemies of God's people. He had everything to be filled with self-confidence. And to be filled with confidence in the things that was at his disposal. But that's not his. That's not his. The way he feels in his. The way the psalmist feels in his soul. Is seeking preservation in the Lord. He was confident only in Yahweh. And the mighty omnipotent God. El. Is the one who has the power to protect him in the face of all this threat. And because he knows that, then what we see now in verses uh, 2 through 6 is a flee, a complete flee, total dependence upon the Lord. Look at verse 2. Now he says, My soul have said to the Lord, You are my Lord. My goodness is nothing a part of you. You see my royal palace? You see all the goods that come upon me and upon my family because of my position in Israel? All these things are nothing apart from the Lord. In this moment of agony, uh, the tendency has been to place our hope in our food chain suppliers, Walmart, Costco, perhaps a local family fair. Our tendency has been to place our trust, again, in the physicians that will provide for us. These are the good things that the Lord has been given to us, right? But that's not where we must place our confidence. Our confidence is to be in the Lord. And even when, and even if all these alternatives fail, it doesn't matter for us. It will not bother us because the Lord is all for us. My goodness is nothing apart from you, says psalmist. I am completely dependent upon you, even when it comes for friendship. Young man, young lad, young lady, this is how you feel. Are you dependent upon the Lord even for friendship? That's exactly how the psalmist feels. Look at verse 3. And as for the saints who are on the earth, they are all excellent ones in whom is all my delight. You see, uh, the psalmist is not only delighted in the Lord. The psalmist is not simply uh, uh, finding his, uh, his fulfillment in the Lord and placing his dependence upon the Lord. But even his, even his friends, even those in whom he delights on this earth, comes from the Lord. They are the saints. They are God's people. You know, here is the testimony of a heavenly 
minded man, of a man who is delighted in the kingdom of God. His delight is in God and in the members of his kingdom. This is a God-centered life. And when we live a God-centered life, our trust and our dependence in our, during our lives and for the preservation of our lives rests in no one else but in El, the almighty, omnipotent God. But you see, as we move on in the psalm, verses 4 through 6, so as that the psalmist show us that the psalmist is not only dependent upon the Lord, the, the psalmist is also extremely satisfied in the Lord in what the Lord has already provided for him right now. Despite of the agony, despite of the troubled soul, who in the moment of trouble addresses the Lord and seeks refuge in the Lord, the things that are under the possession of the psalmist right now are already fulfilled in his soul. And that's what we see now in verses 4 through 6. You know, he says, Their sorrow shall be multiplied who hasten after another gods. The psalmist begins to talk about the idolaters. He says, I will not join them in their idolatry. Look again at the end. Their offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. Uh, after uh, having spoken about his delight being with the people of God, he's saying, my satisfaction is in the Lord alone, and I will have no part in the idolatry of the idolaters of the land. Although they attack me, although they are, my, they are threatening me, I will not give in to their threats. I will not offer at all idolatrous worship, nor will I have communion with those who are idolatrous. Because my satisfy, my satisfaction, what satisfies my soul is the Lord. And that's what we see now in verses 5 and 6. Verse 5, it says, The Lord is my portion. You see, Christian, in the midst of the deep agony and the troubled soul, when the enemies of God's people try to, through this agony, deviate the path, transfer the focus of the psalmist through a, to a different direction, the psalmist responds by saying, No, my focus will remain the Lord, for He is my portion. My eyes are going to remain fixed on Yahweh. Isn't that exactly the name he uses now in verse 5? Take a look at your translation. Here you have the capitalized name of God. All the letters are in capital uh, format, and that's the indication that he, uh, here we have the, the tetragrammaton. Here we have the name of God, Yahweh, the covenantal name of God who points God's people and who points the psalmist to the covenantal love, to the covenantal faithfulness of the Lord that never fails. And it is to this Lord that he's saying, you are my portion. The Lord himself is what he owns. You see, the crown means nothing to the psalmist. The shield, the sword, the spear. The spouses, sons and daughters, the greatness of the kingdom, that means nothing. That's nothing for him. What is the only thing that is for him meaningful and that has value is the Lord. He says, oh Lord, you are my portion, uh, the portion of my inheritance and you are my cup. The Lord is not only what satisfies the psalmist, but the Lord is also the one who provides all satisfaction for him. He says, you maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Now, verse 6 is a reference to the moment in, uh, when the Lord was dividing the land of Canaan and saying uh, uh, to, to the different uh, sons of Abraham, the different sons of of Israel, of Jacob, which portion in the land belonged to each one of the tribes. And, and the psalmist is saying, the portion that has been allotted to me is a pleasant place. It's a place in which abundance is found. 
The Lord is not only my satisfaction, but He is the one who knows how to satisfy me, and He provides satisfaction for me as well. I am satisfying the Lord, and I am satisfying the things that the Lord gives me. Dependence and satisfaction, these are the two things that clearly demonstrate to us that the Lord is the psalmist's portion, is the psalmist's refuge while he is alive. And the same thing is true or must be true for you, Christian. And this is the question, isn't it? Is this true of you? Do you sit here now in your couch uh, seeking satisfaction and dependence on the Lord only? You see, when we are seeking dependence and satisfaction on the Lord, the first thing we're going to, to do, the first thing that will express this satisfaction and dependence is that we address the Lord in the moment of need. Isn't that exactly what we see here in this home? In this moment of persecution and in this, this life-threatening circumstance, he addresses the Lord and he says, El, Almighty God, Omnipotent Lord, preserve me. One of the signs, one of the indications that we're really clinging unto the Lord, that really dependent on the Lord, is when we address Him and we place upon Him, we cast on Him all our anxiety and our fears. We address Him in prayer. We, we direct to Him our thoughts and the desires of our souls. And we plead with Him and we bring it before Him. I'm sure we have been, we have been talking a lot during this past week, haven't we? We have, we have been talking a lot, and we have been talking through many ways. Perhaps in social media, perhaps through texting, perhaps through phone calls, perhaps through conversations in our homes. We have been talking a lot about how badly we feel, about how threatened we feel, about how insecure we feel, but rarely we are addressing the Lord, aren't we? And it seems to me, beloved uh, us brothers and sisters, that it is particular in a circumstance like this, when our lives are threatened by this virus, that the Lord has given us another opportunity to revisit our piety, to re revisit our lives and our souls, and for us to understand, are we truly, indeed, depending on the Lord alone? Is this being expressed in our lives? If it is our talk, our conversation we will be more with Him through our lips, through our thoughts, through our knees than it is on social media and with other people. We talk to the one who truly can change and we address Him through prayer. Are you seeking satisfaction in the Lord? Do you listen to me this morning and are you saying, just like with the psalmist, whatever the Lord sends my way, I have Him. And I'm satisfied. And the things that He has already given me, I'm satisfied. You see, brothers and sisters, I have the feeling that uh, it is precisely in a circumstance like that that we are living right now that the dissatisfaction of our hearts are exposed. Just like one of those wounds, putrefied, that really stinks. That's how our dissatisfaction is shown to us because of this virus. Because all of a sudden, God means nothing to us anymore. All we care about is more news. We want to hear more newscasts coming from wherever place it is, through the radio, through the TV, through the internet. We, we are never satisfied with the Lord alone. We're always complaining about the things that we do not have. We're always complaining about the things that we have, that we think it's not enough. The Lord reminds us this morning that we are to approach Him with satisfaction. The truth is that nothing in this world will satisfy us but the Lord. Nothing in this world and in the world to come will satisfy you, Christian, 
but Yahweh. And the sooner we learn this, the sooner we can experience true satisfaction, the sooner we can put the fear aside, the sooner we can put insecurity aside, because the Lord is ours already, isn't He? Is ours already. Not because we conquered, but because He rescued us. You see, as we meditate upon this ideal of being dependent, and being satisfying in the Lord, it is just unavoidable for us to think about Christ. But we ought to think about Christ not only as the one who, who fulfilled the psalm for us, because Christ indeed was a fully dependent upon the Lord. He was fully dependent upon His Father in heaven, and He was fully satisfied in God Himself. Isn't that clear in His temptation? When he was challenged to, to feel his hunger uh, with bread making uh, made through his own supernatural power, his response was, I am satisfied with the word of my Father. When he was tempted to cling to power without suffering, he says, I will receive power from God, my Father, not from your hand. You see, the Lord Jesus indeed lived a life of dependency and satisfaction in God, and so should more than that. Christ is the one who is the source of our satisfaction and the only one to whom we can cling the protection of the providence. Do you understand that this morning? Don't you remember the cross of your isn't this virus already uh, being used to point you even more to Calvary? Where death was killed. Where you were released from hell. He's in Calvary enough to remind you that uh, all the troubles that sin and, and Satan bring before us are all destroyed at the feet of the cross. The message that comes from the mouth of Christ, isn't that enough to bring you peace and to bring you security? Isn't He the one who invites to Himself those who are heavy laden, those who are hungry, those who are thirsty, those who are tired, those who are deeply anxious, those who are terribly sad? Does He not introduce Himself as the bread of life? Doesn't He offer water that can satiate us fully, completely, and everlastingly? You see, Christian, the solution for this circumstance that comes for us is not found in the White House. It's not found in the state government. It's not found anywhere, not even in your pantry, but it's only found in the person of the Blessed Savior, King Jesus. In Him we can find true satisfaction. He has conquered it all for us at the cross. Through His blood, He offered that perfect sacrifice that appeased the Father. And now, indeed, we can depend on Him and we can be satisfied in Him because He's all that we've got. When physicians fail, when hospitals will be, uh, when hospitals shut down, when when uh, medications are not available anymore, Christ will continue to be all that we've got. Therefore, do not despair. Oh, Christian, rest. Rest in the Lord. Rest in Yahweh, your triune God. He is your rest now. And you are alive. But even when you are dead, even if death comes upon you, the Lord will continue to be your... And that's what we see now in verses 7 through 11, isn't it? As we turn now to this second section of the psalm, we notice that uh, the, the psalmist continues to address the Lord in his, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, deep frustration in his troubled soul, in his circumstance of, uh, of despair, he continues to address him. But he now uh, tells us that the Lord prepares him to live a 
true life. As we examine this, this first verses, we notice that it is because the Lord prepares the Christian to live life. He's our refuge, even when we die. Look at verse 7. He says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night. The first way in which the psalmist has his life prepared for death, has his life lived according to God's standards, so that even when death comes upon him, he will be satisfied and he will be, uh, uh, he, he will be protected, is that the Lord instructs him through his word. Verse 7 talks about this idea of, of instruction, of teaching. And you notice that uh, there is this shift from material to the immaterial. Notice that in verses 1 through 6, uh, the psalmist focus on, uh, on the friends. The psalmist focus on, on the things that the Lord has given him, the lot. But now he's talking about immaterial things. Instruction. Word. Teaching. Even at night, the Lord, through His Spirit, continues to teach and to bless, to give a spiritual counsel, and to instruct the psalmist. That's when life being prepared, even to death. And it is be exactly because of this, of this uh, non-material or this immaterial blessing, this immaterial uh, sustenance, that now he can say what he says in verse 8. The, the Lord I have set always before me. Do you see this, this voluntary disposition? Although uh, the idolaters are threatening him and are trying to drag him into the idolatry, perhaps in an attempt to make an alliance to preserve his life, he already said, I will not get mixed with the idolaters. I will not be involved in their idolatry. Here, here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to voluntarily and purposely in my heart set my eye on the Lord. Christian, I have the feeling that that's exactly what we are not doing in these late days. We're setting our eyes on Fox News. We're setting our eyes on different means and media of communication. We're setting our eyes in our cell phones, seeking for messages from our beloved ones. We are not setting our eyes in the Lord. We're not purposefully directing our focus and our attention towards Him. And that's why fear devour us. Because instead of purposefully directing our thoughts towards this blessed one who saved us and redeemed us, we continue to focus our eyes on the circumstances and what surrounds us. But not the psalmist. The psalmist is purposefully and voluntarily making this, this resolution. I set my eyes before the Lord. For he's the one who governs my life. Isn't that what he says at the second half of verse 8? Look, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. In other words, the psalmist is saying, I am not in control. Now listen, again, listen to this. This is the king of Israel. He's making decisions. Just like you make decisions in your own home. Perhaps you have already set all the rules for people who come. Or uh, uh, for those who live in, your same, in the same house well, uh, that you live. You've got to wash your hands. You gotta, uh, as soon as you come, you gotta put all your clothes to wash. And you're dictating these orders, trying to provide for the safety of your home. Rightly so, there's nothing against it, nothing wrong with it. But as you look at verse 8, it is not in his governing abilities and in his decisions that David is satisfied and is safe. He's safe because it is God who is governing his. Life. That's what the right hand. A uh, statement there in verse 8 stands for. This is pointing to God's government over the life of David. The psalmist is trusting that God is in the position of control and he is guiding all things, he's guiding all circumstances. And aren't we sometimes doubting that that's the case? Don't we catch ourselves all of a sudden needy of listening to people saying to us, God is still in control? God is still sitting on his throne. What an unbelief. What a terrible lack of faith, Christian. I don't know if it is a matter of being reminded or a matter of lack of memory. 
or if it is a matter of lack of faith. Perhaps it is the other one. So let us repent. Sometimes our need is not of is not of to be reminded, but it is to acknowledge our own sin and not setting our eyes, our sight through in the direction that the Lord Himself has given us. Filled with confidence that comes from the Spirit that has already been given unto us, that already indwell us. The Lord prepares us in our life right now, even for death. To remain confident in Him if it comes. In fact, verse 9, what we see is that that's the only life worth living. The only life worth living is the life that is guided and governed by the will of God. So verse 9, he says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. Because I am setting my sight and my, my eyes to the Lord in this, in this dreadful circumstance that has come upon me. Because I am convicted that it is the right hand of God who guides me. Nothing will move me. Now, I can have joy. You're here, Christian. Joy is possible even in the worst conditions. Joy is possible even in the worst conditions only for those who trust that the mighty right hand of God is governing their lives. And other circumstances. And joy is reason. The Lord prepares us in our lives. He helps us to live truly. So that we may die in our refuge. And even when death comes. There is more life to be lived. And that's what we see now in verses 10 and 11. Because. Even if death come, and it will come, perhaps not today, perhaps not this year, perhaps not in 10 years, but it will come. It will knock our door. It's part of our sinful state. Until the Lord reverses it and comes again, death will always be there. But even when she comes, we have our rest. Triune God, Yahweh, the mighty one is our refuge both in life and in death. And in verse 10, he talks about death. He says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. See, the psalmist here is, is saying, My confidence is absolute. Even when death comes, I know that it will not chain me. My happiness and security experienced in life will also be experienced in death. He's not saying that it will not be in Sheol, you see? In verse 10, he says, even if I go down to Sheol. Now, Sheol is the land of the dead. Is the state of being in darkness, in death. Is the state of having his soul separated from your body. Even when he enters in that state, says the psalmist, you will not leave me. Notice that the psalmist is not saying that you are not experiencing it. He's saying that even when I experience it, you will be there. You will be there. You will be there protecting me, taking care. You will not leave me there. You protect my soul. And you protect my body. Look again. Look again at verse B. Part B of verse 10. My soul, you will not live in Sheol, and my body will not see corruption. The contrary, says the psalm. You will take me to presence. You will show me the path of life. Do you notice why then death becomes the portal to life? Because even in the most dreadful circumstance, that is absolutely out of the control of any mortal being. The psalmist relies confident in his refuge that that will be an instrument in God's hands to make him experience through the protection cover his body. 
Divine protection covers his soul. And when death comes, that's when he will experience. And at the end of verse 11, he talks about being the presence of God. Being in his right hand. The human being. At the right hand of God. Now remember that in verse 8, he said that it is the Lord that, it, that is at his right hand. And again, the expression right hand means control, power, authority. Now he's saying, it is exactly when I go down to Sheol that you're going to rescue me, that you're going to give me life. You're going to bring me to your presence. I will be fulfilled with joy. Your right hand will enjoy all You see, Christian, this is exactly what portrays God as our refuge, both in life and in death. Chains of death cannot hold the power of God, they cannot hold the authority of the Almighty. He reaches us there, He rescues us from there. Christian, is this your experience? Not that you have died, but is your experience that even in the face of death, your refuge is Yahweh? Are you feeling this right now? Are you feeling yourself with this conviction coming from God's word in this dreadful circumstance that we are experiencing today? The Lord reminds us this morning. That we are satisfied, we are to be satisfied in Him, and that He is our refuge, both in life and in death. And as He prepares us to live for Him, not only life right now, but in eternal life, He's our refuge, even when death. But once again, as we consider these verses, it's just unavoidable to talk about Christ, isn't it? For when this, these verses were written, it was not about himself that David was talking. Oh, we know about that because that's exactly what Peter tells us in Acts chapter 2. In verses 24, 28, Peter was seeing Jesus. Verses. Paul, the same way. Still in the book of Acts, verses 13, uh, chapter 13, verses 35 through 37, uh, Paul sees Jesus here. Jesus is the one whose soul is not left in Sheol. Jesus is the one whose body does not see corruption. Jesus is the one who inaugurates the path of life through his resurrection. And in his ascension, sits at the right hand of God and guarantees to you, Christian, the refuge that you have in life and in death. And that's the reason why you may sit on your couch. That's the reason why you can... Sit on your dinner table today and be calm, be satisfied, for Yahweh is both in life because of Christ Jesus, who experienced death for you, because of Christ Jesus, who defeated death and ascended into heavens, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, because of Him, you may rest assured, there is no threat that may separate you from His will. We may experience true bliss right now, in the midst of the circumstances, and in the life to come, because our protection and refuge is the Lord alone. You see, as we come to the end of this psalm, isn't it undisputable that it's utterly foolishness to look at the circumstances around us without the goggles of the gospel, without the glasses of redemption. When assailed by distress and despair, David put on his redemptive glass. And he looked through all those circumstances according to the lenses of one who had been saved by Yahweh. Oh, let me 
call you this more dear Christian, dear brother, do not despair. Do not be afraid. For Yahweh, your triune God, is your refuge both in life and in death. Set your eyes on him. Set your thoughts in your mind. Stop talking around and talk to him. Feel your mind and your heart with the assurance that comes from the Spirit and that comes from His Word through His counsel, but especially through His Son. Oh, go back to all over again. Look safety that that cross is conquered. For the death of that Nazarene was your gateway to a blessed life. Let us pray together. Great God in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for reminding us that you are our refuge, both in life and in death. Father, we pray that we would indeed embrace this truth by faith this morning, that it would come upon us by your mighty Spirit, reminding us all these truths, but internalizing them and making us embrace them by faith, putting aside fear, anxiety, uncertainty. Oh, Lord, may we be satisfied with you. May we indeed, oh, Lord, find absolute satisfaction. The point that even if everything fails, may we have only you and you alone and our heart will be glad. Be with us, Lord, we pray. And point us to Christ, the one who experienced all this psalm for us, so that through his blood and through his descending into Sheol, we would be freed to live blessedly, everlastingly. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for being here with me uh, through Psalm 16. My prayer is that. Uh, this will bless your soul, and uh, despite of of me not seeing you and you uh, not, uh, we are we're not enjoying the presence of the people of God. We still are connected through His Word in His Son by His Spirit, and will continue to be faithfully faithful, living for the glory of God. May God bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord shine His face upon you. In I see you soon.